first of all, a question for you. Um, do you prefer the short, very focused assignments, or do you prefer these long term, where you sort of build week to week? I like doing that. Yeah. Would you agree? It doesn't matter. Okay. All right. We we uh, we'll see what's up with that. Uh, let me tell you where we're going to go over the next uh, few classes, and uh, and then uh, then uh, you know we'll, we'll go from there. Again, it was my observation that the students last term seem to prefer the, the the longer ones too, because you're doing something a little more meaningful, you know, instead of just like you know something for the heck of it. All right. Um, so, oh, today. Today I'm going to talk about the last part of the Blackjack Lab, and we're going to talk about what my expectations are, keeping in mind that part of my, when I wrote, when I wrote up this lab originally last semester, I sort of had a wise guy in class, so I put a list of all, all kinds of features <laughs> to like, okay. You want to write a blackjack app here? Here's a list of features. So you don't have to do them all, but we'll talk about what what would be reasonable for that. Um, so I'll talk about like how to accomplish those based on the thought that this is what we have. These are the classes we have because if I'm understanding right, everyone kind of has the same set of classes. They may have different methods and all that, but we'll talk about how to do that. So that's what we'll do first part of today. I'll also answer any questions that you have individually that you want me to, to answer as far as the Black Jack, the Black Jack Lab. Wednesday will be a day for peer review and will be a work day. And that will be the last day we'll work in class on that. Um, and any extra time that we have today, I'm going to start covering a, um, what is it called, an address book app from the Deedle example. And the focus is going to be on database interactivity. All right, so I think this is a good one to cover because a lot of apps require database interactivity, and so we can we can do that. Um, I may one thing that we did last term that was kind of fun, and um, I just I, I probably will do it this term. I just need to figure out where it's going to fit in the agenda. Is to do the card game set. I don't know if, if you've ever played the card game set. It, it's kind of fun. It, 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 it is one is one that seems impossible at first glance, but after a little bit of time, it's like, oh, okay, I get it. All right. So it's kind it's kind of fun. It's, it, it, it's a card game that typically you play like with several people, but we can we can sort of reformat it to be more like a puzzle um, on the. Uh, within our application. So we'll do that. All right. Um, part of homework nine is to have at least a couple people review your code. That would be difficult to do if you guys are the only two that show up on, on uh, Wednesday. But, you know, we may relax that a little bit. You won't have to flag someone down in the hall and have them take a look at your code too. Uh, but have someone review your code. And refactor it. And again, the whole knowledge of refactoring is like looking at and seeing the observations and making some improvements of it. It doesn't mean you necessarily rewrite the whole thing, but hear what they have to say, maybe look to see it how someone else did something, and maybe see where you could make some improvements. Um, and then add some functionality. Now, it's more important to me that what you do works rather than you add a lot of half-working functionality. All right. What I want you to do, sort of, uh, the lab eight was to make a single hand of blackjack. All right. So what I want to do in lab nine is make it more like a complete app, and that could include things such as keeping track of wins and losses, betting. What else do I have here? Um, change so each hand is not a new deck. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Insurance, 
splitting, this is where I was getting into the, sort of the obscure uh, features. Insurance splitting. I wouldn't expect anyone to do those, but hey, if you feel ambitious, go for it. Adding the image of the cards, which I'm not sure if it was included in Lab 8 or not. I kind of thought it was, but I guess maybe not. And then possibly having alternate images. All right. Wins and losses should be obvious. Betting, you can, by the way, look up online for more comprehensive rules of blackjack. For example, if you bet and you get blackjack, you actually win 1.5 to 1. So in other words, if you bet $10 and you got blackjack, you'd win $15. I'm not going to be a stickler to rules. This isn't something we're taking to Vegas and all that. So, you know, implement some form of betting. Also, there are some variations uh, between casinos, how casinos handle certain things, such as insurance and splitting and, and all that. All right. But wins and losses should be obvious. Betting should be fairly obvious. All right. Each hand a new deck. Apparently, that may vary from place to place. The one that I heard is that if there's more than 70% of the deck used, you start with a new deck. All right? Although I read elsewhere online that you use a new deck every time. All right? Insurance. Insurance, you can put down if the dealer is showing an A. That means that you're probably in trouble, or you could be in trouble, right? Because there's a good chance, or there's a chance that they may have blackjack. All right. The dealer is showing an ace. You could put down 50% of your original bet. If the dealer indeed has blackjack, you get paid two times that. Of course, you lose your original bet. Effectively, you break even if the dealer has blackjack for that extra $5 bet. Now, if the dealer doesn't have blackjack, you lose that $5, and then you either win or lose the 10 So it's kind of a risky thing. Again, there's places online uh, to do this where you can check this. Splitting is if you have two cards the same. You know, queen and a queen. You can actually split and play it as though it's two hands. Okay? Um, and then you can bet on each and then you have the potential to win. Uh, 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 you would likely do that if it was like a face card or an ace. Because either of those, you know, you stand a risk, uh, or you stand a good uh, chance of, like, getting 21 on a couple of them. All right. Image. I thought that was required for Lab 8, but if not, I want you, this one I kind of want you to do on Lab 8. Alternate image would be where the user could select between different decks of cards. And I had students last year that had Star Wars cards, and they, you can find online... Uh, you know, uh, I images that you can use for that. I would say if you do this and this, that's probably minimal. If you do those two, and re plus refactor your code based on feedback, that should be adequate for lab nine. That makes it more of a complete app. This one is a good one to explore. So this one is sort of, this one I'd say is sort of an A tier. This would be a B tier. In other words, you get done with the two A tiers and your little board, put B in. If you feel so inclined, same thing as B, same thing with alternate images. That could be fun to do, or it could not be fun to do. So it's your choice to do that. Uh, these two are kind of C tiers. 
In other words, if you already have all this done anyhow and you want something to do for the next week, then work on those things. Okay, and you can, again, go online and get a better description or more complete description of what these things uh, entail. Now, even though they're not required, I like to talk about each of these and talk about how, we're, how you could implement them, all right, from an object perspective, all right? Let's remember what objects we have. And if I remember, your names may vary, but most folks had these four classes. Are there any other classes that I'm missing? of the player class or instead of the player class? You know what? I was going to use it, then I didn't. Okay, so yeah. Okay. Um, you could actually have a hand class as well, or you could actually have a, a player class that did the role of the hand class. Probably, well, we'll, we'll come to that when, when, we, when we get to it. Let's talk about the first one, betting. Where does that functionality live? Now keep in mind that it's probably going to live in several places, right? The other thing that we have is we have the UI and the activity. How are we going to implement betting? Are we going Repeat that please. Yeah, the player class will probably keep track of the wins and losses for the amount of dollars. All right. Will these other classes be at all affected? I think the rules would have. The rules would be affected too because there's some funky things like. If you get blackjack, you win 1.5 to 1. And if you and, and other bets are 1 to 1. And then you get into splitting and insurance. So there would have to be that, that it ends up ultimately in the player class. There should be something in the rules class to do evaluation of it as well. Anything else? Deck and card, they going to be affected? Shouldn't be. UI? Yeah, there'll probably be something in the UI where the user can enter their bat. Activity? Maybe like some validation code so that, you know, they, they enter in a numeric value or they, they put something in for their bat or something along those lines. I always think it's a good idea to do this, and I, I, I've said um, a lot of times that, you know, this is what I call sometimes taking inventory. That is, we're looking at what we have in terms of what we already have in our app, and then we're looking at, like, what needs to change, all right? That can be challenging in an object-oriented environment, all right? You guys did a good job identifying the places that, this one would be required, but sometimes it's a little less obvious. So, um, you know, it, it's important in my mind to, to do that um, and figure out uh, what that is. Okay, so that would apply to wins and losses and allowing betting. All right, what if we wanted to have it so that we started with a new deck when more than 70% of the deck was used. What do you think is going to change there? 
Where do you think that code's going to live? I have that in the rules. All right. So I think that would be part of the evaluation at the end of a game. Right? So at the end of the game, you look to see who won or lost. Because you don't start with a new deck in the middle of a hand. You would only start with a new deck after a hand. So you evaluate the percentage of cards left and then create a new deck. Or reinitialize a deck. Would I have to do something to the deck class itself? What, if anything, would I need in the deck class itself to support this? Yeah, would need to know how many cards were in the deck. All right. So you may already have that method in there. But if you don't, you'd need a method to count the number of cards that were left. And then, depending on how you coded it, you might not need anything else because you could call the constructor again and actually create a brand new deck object. Or if you didn't want to do that, you could have an initialization routine and have that go through and re recreate all the cards and shuffle them and so on. Now, if you really wanted to be clever, you could have your constructor call an, initial, an initialization routine. That way you'd keep it consistent. So whether it's a new deck or reshuffling an existing deck, the same code gets called. Adding insurance, and again, what insurance is, is where if the dealer is showing an ace, you, you, you prompt, you, you ask the user, or the user has the option of putting down a bet equivalent to 50% of their original bet, and if the dealer has blackjack, they win two to one on that bet, but they lose their original bet. <laughs> so... Where is that going to live? Number one in the rules, right? It's going to be in the rules two different ways. One, to determine if the option for insurance is available. Remember, you don't get insurance all the time. You don't get the option to have insurance all the time. You only get the option of insurance if the dealer is showing an ace. So, at the very least, after the cards are dealt, your rules is going to have to your group your rules would have to look at the hand and evaluate is insurance in play for that. Now, from there. There could be something in the UI that gets enabled. You could, for example, have a insurance radio button that gets turned off, turned on, enabled or disabled based on whether the dealer is showing an ace. All right. You can handle that any number of different ways. Last. The rules would come into play again to evaluate the bet. In other words, the, dealer, the player now has two bets going on on a hand. All right? So we might even need, I don't know. We might need something in the player if the player is handling the bets. We might not, though, because remember, when you have insurance, we know the amount of the bet. The amount of the bet is 50%, the original bet. So maybe all we need is a flag that says they bought insurance or not. But in the rules, we have to evaluate the bet because now they really have two bets that they have insurance. They have that regular $10 bet that they win or lose based on whether they won the hand or lost the hand. And then they have the 50% bet that bets whether the dealer has blackjack or not. They win that if the dealer has blackjack. 
They lose that if the dealer doesn't have blackjack. So the rules would have to evaluate two bets instead of one bet. This is probably the most intriguing one coming up, splitting a hand. Splitting a hand. All right? That's where if you get two cards that are the same, you can split them and play both hands independently. What would we need to change to implement that? We have a UI issue, so we're going to have to change the UI to have allow for maybe allow splitting, I'll just say. Again, I'm more interested in talking through in general terms how to do this. Um, it's your job to figure out how to do it if you should do this. Um, so yeah, you'd have to physically show the, U, the, the UI of the two hands. You have to have two hands. Okay, you have to have two hands for the player. Now, you had mentioned about a hand object and a player object before. This is where it might make sense to have a separate hand and player object. All right? Because in, in the case of splitting, the player actually has two hands. And they have two bets. So we might make a hand object. There would probably be a constructor in the hand object that accepted just one card, right? You might have, if you had this hand object, you might have a two card constructor, which is what normally happens when you deal blackjack. In the case of splitting, you could take the one card, create a second hand from it, and call the one card constructor to initialize it and then the dealer would have to deal the other two cards. Part of the allow splitting, by the way, would include different stay and hold buttons, right? Because not only do we show the hand, but you can stay on one hand and hold on the other. A bet, then, might be associated with the hand instead of associated with the player, if you took the splitting approach. What else would need to change? Well, the, to, to in, in other words, you're saying the code to evaluate a hand. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. On splitting, I'm, I would have to learn more about the role of, of blackjack to understand. If you split, you're playing. Essentially, if you're if you're if you split, you're playing two hands. Okay. So if I got dealt two tens, I could split them. The dealer then gives me a second card for each of the hands. So I'm now playing two hands. Each of the car, each of the hands has a ten in them, and then whatever the dealer gave me. All right, so I'm treating those like they're different hands. Now, depending how you've written the code in the rules, you might have to have to change the evaluation routine, right? Because if the evaluation routine looks at a hand object, you just look at it twice. You look at two different hand objects and compare it with the dealer. All right, you compare player hand A and player hand B with the dealer and determine a win or loss. So depending on how you write that, you may not have to change the rule object part to evaluate the hands. You would have to change something in the rule uh, uh, class, though. What something would have to change in the rule class? Well, are you allowed to split any hand? No. If I get a 10 and a 9, I can't split that. So therefore, just like, is this hand eligible for insurance? There would be, is this hand eligible for splitting? So there would be something in the rules class to say eligible. All right. The last two things that we're going to look at, images and then alternate images. Images.
images, well, we change the UI to have images instead of text. That's kind of a no-brainer. Where would our, where else would we need to change? Let's say originally we're displaying text for this. Where, what would we change to display images? understanding you is that the activity would do the inflating then ask the deck which would ask the card for the name of the image Which 
deck I wanted to use. Do I want to use the Star Wars deck or the Lord of the Rings deck or whatever? And this get image would actually return, could return one of two things. It could either return an image itself, an image view itself, or it could include a text and then the inflator take and take that text and inflate it to create an image on there. I'd ask, the, I'd ask the card again, give me the image that represents you. All right, that's a good case of encapsulation. Then, only the card has to have that knowledge of how the uh, file name is set. All right, other objects throughout here don't have to know about that. All right, if we were writing, let's say, let's say we were writing a, you know, 10 card game application, and Blackjack was one of them, and we had, I don't know, War as another one, or some other card game, all right? If the logic and the intelligence to piece together the name of the card was here, then we'd have to duplicate that here. Then if we added some other layer in, then we'd have to change it in several places. Whereas if the card is responsible for giving either the image or the text name, alternately the asset name for the image, then all these don't need to worry about how do I formulate the image name. You just ask the image class. Again, that's a case, of a notion of encapsulation where all of the behavior associated with one kind of thing lives in that particular class. All right. Does anyone have questions over what they're doing? To refresh your memory, this last part of it, add a couple of these features in. You don't have to add them all. All right. And uh, this Wednesday will be a chance for you to work on it here and also a peer review where you look at each other's code, see what everyone else did, and possibly make some adjustments to streamline your code and all that. Yeah. I don't care, you know, when um, I, I talked a little bit about the game of set earlier in class. You know, I've been programming for 100 years, and a student showed me a good algorithm to use in that case. So it doesn't matter how long you've been coding or what your experience, there's always a chance to learn how someone else does it. And even if you don't agree with the way they did it, and even if you want to stick with your original approach. It's good to see that and understand it, and then you can make an intelligent decision like, yeah, I like the way I do it, or, yeah, gee, maybe that other person's on to something. All right. So, Wednesday is a work slash peer review day, so you'll have some time to work together and then work individually on it. The remainder of class today, we're going to look at databases. All right, we're going to start looking at databases. Your next project after this is going to involve some sort of database. At some point, we'll probably do another one of these extended applications where we do something over two or three weeks. All right? And, in fact, we may even do it like as a group. Last term we did it as a group. Um, and it was kind of fun. It was kind of fun because it gave us an excuse to play the card game for a while until everyone learned it. So that, that part of it was fun. And it was fun because people got starting to yell at each other and all that. And that's always fun, as you know. All right. All right. We're going to look at the, the address book example from Deedle. I'm trying to alternate a little bit between um, the Deedle applications and other more fun applications. The address book is pretty simple. I have it installed on here. Actually, when you install it, it comes to a blank screen. Horrible interface design, but that's not what we're looking at here. All right. I click the menu, and I get an option to add a contact. I click the add a contact. I get a form. All right. A form to go and display um, or look at different stuff. So I could put in a name. Oh, let's, let's not put in a name. I hit save contact. 
it tells me I need to put in a name. I put in a name, put in a phone, and so on. I don't think I have to put everything in. I click save, and there's my contact on the list. All right. I tap the contact, contact rather, and I'm viewing the contact data. I hit the menu, I can either edit or delete. If I edit it, I go back in this mode. If I delete, I get confirmed, and then I can delete it. Now, there's a couple things that are different about this one than any of them that we've seen so far, if I'm not mistaken. One thing that's different is this actually uses a relational database. Not a complicated database, but it uses a database to store the data. We've talked about other ways to store the data um, within an application. We saw in the, um, what was it, the Twitter search one, where we use shared preferences. Shared preferences are a very simplistic way to store data. If you remember with shared preferences, what you have is you have an ordered pair. You have a key and a value. So in the Twitter example, the key was like the tag that we gave it. And the value was the full Twitter search that we were going to do. So these were stored as an ordered pair, key and value. So shared preferences are good when you're talking about basically a list of things, all right? You could use shared preferences, for example, to show a user's, to store a user's profile, right? A user's profile is going to be something like, you know, their name, their email address, their telephone number. And again, you could create a shared preference where one of the keys was name and the value of that would be the person's name. One of the keys was email, and the value would be the person's email address, and so on down the line. So for saving a simple list of things, or like in some of our uh, apps, we've had options for people to like show animation, yes or no, all right? Um, in the flag game, show, have three choices, six choices, nine choices, show which regions. We could actually store those in shared preferences and have those be persistent. So in other words, the next time we ran the app, we'd get the same options that we ended up with. And if we were doing a blackjack game, we could store like the deck, the kind of deck, or the amount of money the person left with as uh, a, a, in the short, in the stair, I want to say, I'm trying to say either shared or stored. It's shared preferences, all right? And then it would be persistent between time to time. Now when I talk about persistent data, it's easy to be fooled in an Android app, all right? Because if I start an app, and I'm just going to enter someone in, I entered Mike in, Mike's on the list. If I go and go to my main screen and open up my Android Kindle application, then come back to my address book app, I could look and say, hey, that's persistent data. It stayed there. That actually isn't. A better test would be is if I went through an application manager and clobbered that program, terminated it, or if I actually powered off my device. Because when I go, if I'm running this app, and I go and close out of it, that app's still running, all right? And therefore, the data may not necessarily be persistent. So persistent means that even when the app dies, even when I power off the application, it's still, or power off the device, it's still going to be there. Now, 
Shared preferences are good for simple lists of data. So like with the Twitter search app, that's all we needed. All right. Big believer in the right tool for the right job, right? You don't use a sledgehammer to crack a walnut. All right. Using something like relational databases could be a little bit of overkill in the case of a, uh, a, a simple application where you just need a little list of things. But if you're going to do any sort of related data and do something a little more involved, then a relational database is the way to go. So, for example, in this case, I have a list of contacts. Each contact has a name, has a phone number, has an email address. It's not a list about one person. It's a list about a bunch of people. So, therefore, I could probably figure out a way to do it with shared preferences, but creating a relational database with a contact table is going to be the better way to go. All right. So that's one of the main things we're going to look at in this app. The second thing we're going to look in this app is I believe this is the first one where we have two different screens. Pretty sure it's the first example of two different screens. Whereas, when you go in, you see a list of activity of, uh, of uh, not activities, but of, uh, of people. When I click on one, I get a view screen. And then when I click on edit, I get a different screen altogether. All right? These are different activities. So, so far, our applications have been single activity. And think of an activity as more or less equating to a screen that you're showing the user, a screen that you're showing the user and you want the user to do something. Very first screen, we're showing them a list of contacts where we want them to do something. Either select the option to add a contact or select, click on one of the contacts to add it. Second screen of if we added a contact, we have a screen with text boxes that you can fill in and save. It's another activity. In the case of viewing a person, we actually have another activity where there's a read-only view and then there's an edit view. All right? And so there's another activity still. So that's going to be a big difference between this and other applications, so those two things. So I'm going to focus just on those two pieces. I'm not necessarily going to dwell on every aspect of the app, but we're going to focus on those two pieces of it. So let's start off by looking at what's different for there to be two activities. And I think I lied. I think the Twitter, I think the Twitter activity actually had two, or Twitter app actually had two activities. One to view the list, one to fire up a web browser and do a search. But in this case, we are writing the two activities, so it is different. We see three XML files. Our first XML file is a list. Oh, that's contact list item, my mistake.
that we do not have, we have three different layouts. We have one to view a contact. We have one to add a contact. And we have the inflated one, the one that's going to get inflated, for an individual contact for the list. We don't have an XML file for the list of contacts. We have an XML file for one contact, but not for the list. What's the difference here? Why don't we have that? This activity is defined as a list activity. All right. What does that mean? That means that this activity already is built around the fact that there's a list associated with this. So we do not need a separate list XML. We're, we're creating, we, we get for free the list view associated with the list activity. That's why if we look at the layout, we have an add mode, a view mode, and we have the XML for a single content, but we do not have the XML for the list. That is because, again, this is a list activity, and the list layout that we get comes for free. All right. It's confused for a second there. Let's look at the manifest file. And I'm going to bring it into text edit so we can see. manifest. We have a couple of other activities associated with this. I believe the rest of this stuff has been in all the manifest files. But the difference here is we are creating or we are informing the Android platform that this application handles these other activities. All right. We'll see examples towards the end of the class where a different application handles. A, new, uh, a different activity. For example, I could have a button on my view that fires up the camera. Well, I'm not going to write the code to do a camera, right? I am, uh, I'm going to use the built-in functionality of Android. So it's not going to be my app that handles the camera stuff of focusing and taking a picture and all that. So I'll have an activity to launch the camera, but someone else is going to be handling it. In this particular case, I'm saying my app is going to handle these other activities, all right, as opposed to letting someone else handle the activities that we're doing, OK? Again. You can more or less equate an activity to one screen that the user is seeing. All right. I think that's all I wanted to look at here. We do have a couple of menu XMLs down here. Let's look at the classes here. First one I want to look at is we have a database connector class. And let's 
let's copy and paste this code to text edit again. Again, we're encapsulating. We don't want every one of our objects or classes to worry about the database. So we're writing a single class that's going to do our database work for it. So if any of these other activities needs database work done, it contacts this class. All right? So we're going to have, we have three activities, the read-only, or the list, the read-only, and the edit. Three activities. Each one of those does some database work. The list shows me a list of all my contacts. The edit or add allows me to update or insert or update data in the tables, as well as view a selected contact. And the query to bring up one contact, a contact simply goes out and, and grabs and displays one contact. All right. So, we have some parameters here. We have a database name, user contacts. We actually could have multiple databases within an application. Um, if, if your application was doing two sort of different things, we could have two different databases. Again, otherwise, the whole idea of databases is storing all, you know, your data in one common place. So, won't necessarily be terribly common to have multiple databases, but you could. SQLite is a database that we're using. So we're creating a database object. Then we're creating a database helper object. Again, these objects are simply used, that the helper object simply helps us access and manipulate the database. So we don't have to worry about sort of those low-level commands to go and execute it. We simply make calls to the functions on the helper, and the helper does its thing. Now, we have our constructor. As we create one of these, we grab a database helper that points to our database. So we now have that code that is going to help us access the database in this object. That's on the constructor. So as soon as we construct one of these guys, our database connector object, we go and create the helper that's going to allow us to access the database. When we open the database, we use the database helper object to get writable database. Actually, they're yeah they're using they're using we're extending the, the SQL open helper so that we can put our own code in here all right so our database open helper is an extension of SQL open helper because we're putting our own code in it So when we open the database and we get the writable database, what happens the very first time and the database hasn't been created yet? All right. Because if we in 
install the app, installing the app doesn't create the database. Installing the app simply installs the app. So, if we try to get a writable copy of the open database, of the database that we want to open, through our helper, it will do one of two things. If the database exists, it gives us a pointer to the database, and we're good to go. We can go on and do our thing. If the database doesn't exist, it has to create it. Well, how do we know, and how does it know how to create it, and what instructions to use, and so on? It knows based on the onCreate method. So if I call the getWritableDatabase method, and the database already exists, we get a pointer to it. If the database doesn't exist, because this extends SQLite helper and the database doesn't exist, this onCreate method is going to execute. And what does that onCreate method do? It actually creates one or more than one query that creates our database table. So, our query says, it's a standard SQL statement. Um, we typically don't talk about uh, these uh, uh, data definition language in like the 143 class, but there's instructions in SQL that allow you to actually create tables, create indexes, create keys. And the create table is one of them. Create table contacts. So the name of the table that we're creating is called contacts. We have a field that's called ID, which is an integer, which is a primary key, and which is an auto increment. All right. Um, auto increment is like an auto number in access, where each row inserted gets the next number in sequence. We have a text field called name, a text field called email, a text field called phone, a text field called street, a text field called city. And then we execute that query. Executing that query creates the database and creates the table that we need to do our job. All right. How does this get called? This gets called if we call the open writable database up here, which in our database connector class, when we invoke the open, it's going to call get writable database. Our helper is either going to give us a pointer to the database if it already exists, or it's going to give us, is going to create the database and then execute the onCreate code to create the table. All right. Now, there's actually something that we're not going to get into in this example, but something you should be aware of. Because the problem comes in, what if you are upgrading a database? Like, in the initial version of the database, you might have six fields in the contact table. Well, what if you go and add a field in the contact table? All right, or add two fields, or add another table, or whatever. That onCreate logic only fires off when you're initially creating the database. So how do we make modifications to the database? You make modifications by assigning a version to the database. And then what you can do is you can write code in the onUpgrade method that will go in and will look at the old version of the database and the new version of the database. And you can then write logic to say if I'm going from version 1 to version 2, I want to add this table. If I'm going version 1 to, to version 3, add this table and add this column, and so on. So you can actually get pretty involved so that when people upgrade, they don't lose their data, right? They don't start with a fresh database. But you write the commands that transforms the database of the older version to the database of the newer version. So we're not going to do anything in this example. Now here's a word to the wise. If you're doing an application like this and you change the format of the database, 
for our purposes, the best thing to do, since we're just we're not dealing with actual real, real data or volumes of data, simply uninstall the application from your device and let the OnCreate run again. So, for example, if I decided I wanted an extra field in the contacts table, I, I wouldn't go in and try to write upgrade code. For our purposes, the easiest thing to do would be to simply to delete uh, uninstall the application off of my device and then go and reinstall it and let it recreate the database. So, if we look at our activity, our address book activity, Excuse me. We'll notice that when the application starts or resumes, we call our get contact task. Notice we're not calling that function the way we call a normal function. There's a third thing I forgot to mention about this. This gets involved with threading. It calls this, and this is where we go and create our database connector, which in turn will create the database and then get all the contacts and so on. Let's take a minute about threading. All right? And we'll pick up on this. When I pick up on this application next Monday, we'll review all this stuff. Actually, let's, let's not talk about threading now. I'd rather finish one thought than bring in a second thought. We can talk about threading next time. Do notice that this is not an ordinary function call, though. We call what's called an asynchronous task. Let's look at other database functions here. Here we're creating the database. Here we have a query to get all contacts. Notice that we don't have to write SQL statements. We simply write a call to the database query method supply the name of the table, supply a list or an array of the columns that we want, then we could have a WHERE clause or whatever, and the final thing is the ORDER BY clause. So what database statement is this going to generate? It's going to generate a SELECT statement. Each one of these arguments to the functions is a different piece of the SELECT statement. Now, in this case, if I wanted to select every contact, the ID and name, the SQL statement would look something like select ID name from contact, order by name. That's exactly what we're supplying here. We're doing a query. That means a select statement. What table are we selecting it from? The contacts table. What fields do I want? Here's a list of them. I want the ID and name. Is there a WHERE clause? Is there a JOIN clause? I forget what the third one is, a GROUP BY clause? No, there isn't. So those arguments are all null. Finally, what's the ORDER BY clause? Well, I want this ordered by name. So it will give me that. Now, notice the difference between the SELECT 
or get all contacts and get one contact. In both cases, the get one contact method, it calls a database query. What table? Contacts. Null means it's going to return every column. It's like doing a select star. The where clause here is ID equals ID. So we're going to add a where clause to it. So really, we're piecing together the SQL statement by using this database query method. Now, in both cases, this returns a cursor. A cursor is a structure that's like an array that allows us to loop through and grab each item in turn and do whatever we need to with it. Now, to finish up looking at this class, to insert a contact, notice that we have an insert statement that, again, mimics sort of a SQL database insert statement, the name of the column, the value that we want, and then does an insert. An update that does the same thing, except it doesn't do an insert, it does an update, and as we know in SQL, with an update, you need to specify some sort of where clause. Or you'll up, otherwise, you'll update everything in the database table. So I'm supplying the ID that I want to update. Last but not least, we have a delete statement that does the same thing. And I just can't see where that is. Right here, delete contact. We get the ID, we delete from the table, and away we go. So in effect, we write, we're, we're invoking SQL statements, but without knowing SQL. We're using that database object and calling either the query, the delete, the update, or the insert method on it. And we pass the appropriate values to it. How familiar are you all with basic SQL operation? Pretty good? Yeah, for eight years. Okay. It's a little rusty. We, we could, we'll take more of a look uh, on this. Um, what we'll do next time is we'll review the database piece again. Again, in the meantime, please download the DDL application and take a look at it. But we'll review the database thing, then we'll look at things such as the other activities, the threading of this, and also the try-catch. Because if you notice, these operations can throw errors. I think I saw a couple cases of that in here. Where it can throw an error and we want to be able to handle it. So there's also try-catch. Threading and try-catch are two things that you do when operations are relatively risky. What do I mean by risky? I mean that they're outside of just normal function calling. All right? Running a database query, you don't know what you're getting. Right? You could get five rows in your query. You could get a million rows in your query. All right. So therefore, I'm not really sure how long that's going to take. If I have a function that just has a bunch of mathematical statements, yeah, that's not going to take any time at all. All right. But call it. It's going to do its job and return it. Doing some sort of database operation, though, has the potential of taking a long time. And it also has the potential... Um, if something was wrong with the database engine or the data or something like that, to give us, how do I want to say, unexpected, unanticipated results. So for these reasons, we have to do things with threading and we have to do exception catching with that. So we'll review this um, next Monday. Again, Wednesday, peer review and work day. Any questions about this? Microsoft has like a .NET, you can see the table or... 
That is a darn good question. I believe there is. I remember doing that. I remember doing that. Um, let's let's Google real quick. like there's a variety of this is the one I have used I've used the Firefox SQLite manager and that's a way to do that um, I am not sure if there's anything like an Android studio that would do that more seamlessly I don't believe there's anything in Eclipse that would do that uh, but yeah, but it's not necessarily as easy as you'd like it to be to answer your question. Other questions? All right, that's all I had for today. Again, you're welcome to stay 